So, so this talk may be a little different than the last couple. Um, I actually planned to major in physics in college until I took my first physics course, and everything was, was too precise. And uh, over on the computer side, there were these people playing with these new ideas, what we now call artificial intelligence, this crazy idea that we could get computers to think. But a lot of the, the approaches being used were approximate. You, you sort of said, it kind of can do this, and maybe like that. Uh, so maybe quantum physics would have made me happier, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, too advanced at that point. So I, I went into AI. And so <clears throat> I used the term social machines. It's actually the title of a book a colleague and I wrote, uh, available on Amazon. I published, told my publisher I would mention it at every talk. Um, <laughs> and the... Uh, the discussion goes through three different things. So three different ways this term is used. One is really just talking about sort of lots and lots of stuff going on out there. So there's a social machines lab at MIT, but really all they're doing, uh, it's a big deal, but they're doing Twitter analysis, but nothing else. So to them, Twitter is a social machine that lets people talk to each other. A second version is really when we hold up our cell phones, when we talk about Going out, so nowadays when you go out to dinner, you often have something where you can actually see what is this crazy ingredient. Uh, so, so if you go to like fancy restaurants now, they've gone to using funny names, fancy names for all these ingredients they use. So they used to say lettuce. Now it has 26 different names for the different kinds of lettuces because you can Google it sitting right at your, your table and they know people will do that. So we've sort of, uh, and you know, you, you, you text people while you're, you're Sitting here, you're, half of you are probably going to be using Facebook by the end of the talk, um, things like that. So, so this machine has become part of our social world, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. The third one is sort of a, an emerging concept, which is when you look at some of the systems we have today, you, you see something like a Facebook or some of these other systems where people are talking together and it's become a communication network, but those social networks would be much more powerful. They could really be enhanced by sort of a, a networks of machines supporting networks of people, and that's really where the book ends. And if I had more time today, that's where I would try to get to, and I'll hint at it a little at the end. But mostly what I want to do is some level setting, because many people in this room know a lot about AI, many don't know very much about it, and many of the talks and demos and things that will be shown over the next couple of days really will talk about AI, really will address this question of, of sort of who plays the best go. Um, and so what I'm going to do is talk about some of this stuff, but I want to set a context because a lot of people have been thinking about AI for many years as some future thing that's eventually going to happen. Uh, we hear discussions by people like uh, Steve Hawking. I, I really like talking about AI nowadays because I get to say, I get to argue with the smartest man in the world because Steve Hawking has been saying that AI is going to be the death of us all, and I actually think it's not. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> ask me the same question you asked them, by the way, later. I, I really have a good answer for AI in that. Um, but, but here's an example, right? And this is, this is not a... Uh, a, a made-up, fictitious example, okay? So the U.S. administration recently, in the past few months, has solicited technology firms, including two of them we've just heard from and many others, to develop software that would use artificial intelligence to examine prospective, in, prospective immigrants for the risk of creating terrorist acts. Okay, so now we're talking about something where, so if you want to decide Right? Would you, I was asked, would I sign a letter opposing this? Right? What do you need to, and I said yes, I was very happy to sign the letter opposing this. Based on technical, not a, this was not an ethical question. There was another letter, you know, should we do this at all? But this was the technical question. So 54 of us signed a letter saying, this is a bad technology to use for this right now. Now, what did we have to know to be able to ask that stuff, to, to sort of address it? Our policy, ethics, and politics are starting to require understanding this stuff, right? It's no longer the case that sort of some kind of conceptual knowledge that there's something out there called AI that's going on in some labs might someday affect us. 
this is really starting to become something that plays in, in the politics of today. And there are decisions that are being made now that affect lives, often people's lives. And these decisions are being made by people who have very little understanding of the boundaries of the technology. Now, I have another talk I'm not going to give today, which is sort of the ethics and AI talk, where I could go through lots and lots and lots of examples of this. The US Supreme Court has recently had to weigh in on whether a judge could use a device that was a data based machine learning device without it having to report on how it works and things like that. So there's issues of accountability and stuff. But what's really making this happen has been a combination of several things hitting all together. So um, there, were, there was a slide sort of saying, you know, we kind of went to the 1960s in, in machinery and then it kind of started up a curve. We often refer to that as the knee in the exponential curve. Right? So if you ever graph something exponentially, it sort of seems to grow slowly for a while, then suddenly it starts shooting up. And what's happened is three of the AI technologies have been, been coming through that knee and that curve. And so what's happened is each of these separately, plus some combinations of them, although they don't yet fit together, um, have been making it possible to do some new and exciting things with computers. But of course, as with uh, the conversation we just had, when somebody talks about an intelligent computer, when we see a computer beat the world's best Go player, then people start to think computers can do a lot of other things, right? And so I want to talk today a little bit about these technologies, about humans, and about why that's important. And then I don't have enough time to do this in detail, but I'm going to hint a little bit about the fact that we got to bring these things together. And that's really the, the research um, platform that I'm trying to, the refor sort of what I'm trying to push agencies to pay attention to, what I'm trying to get my students looking at, which is new things are out there. We have to merge them with the old stuff, and then we have to figure out how to bring humans into loop. So let's look at some of these things going on. So <clears throat> the one that's probably driven the most uh, of all of this is something called deep learning technology. Deep learning is just one kind of machine learning technology, and it's mostly been driven by extending the abilities of neural networks. So there were some math that proved neural networks could only do certain things under certain capabilities unless you had certain kinds of computation. And for a long time, people were sort of avoiding some of this stuff, but a small group of people were really pushing in a new direction and showed that there were some limits to that math that could be broken. So all of a sudden, you had some new architecture, some new algorithms, things like that, that could come together. And where it really showed its biggest difference was in um, machine uh, vision. So there was a competition held each year. So a bunch of pictures of things were shown to people, right? Is this a cat? Is this a duck? Is this a horse? Is this a building? Is this a car? Right? And, and, the, and many, many things were labeled. So I'm going to talk later about cats and ducks. So I'm using that as my examples today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and humans would get typically sort of, if you looked at the ground truth, what they really were pictures of and what you asked people to select from different categories, people were getting about 90, 91%. Five years ago, machines were getting about 70%. Four years ago, Actually, it's six and five years ago. Uh, the machine suddenly got up to about 88%. And three years ago, it hit 92%. So it beat humans. And now it's been climbing steadily since. So this suddenly was a technology for something known to be very hard for computers that suddenly went zooming ahead of human capability. Right? So we could train computers to recognize these things. So for example, in an image, we can take these pictures. So here's a bird eating a frog. I'll come back later to this one in um, the upper right for you. So the person, the dog, and the chair. So yellow boxes around a person, red boxes around a dog, green boxes around chairs, person car helmet. So, so increasingly powerful techniques have yielded these really powerful results. So this is, um, has gone from recognizing a single item to recognizing sets of items. Uh, people are now working on learning the relationships among those sets of items, et cetera. Okay. A second big change happened in 2011 in February, and this was really 
generated more excitement in the U.S. than just about anywhere else, because in the U.S. we have a game show called Jeopardy. I'm sure it's up here, too. Um, I saw the first Jeopardy game I ever went to when I was in second grade, and I'll, I'll tell you a lot of you weren't born yet. So it, it ran for many years, went away for a little while, came back in a new form. Very, very popular game. And this guy, his name Ken Jennings. Ken is to Jeopardy what Michael Jordan is to basketball. Just the greatest ever. I mean, no one argues uh, about that anymore. The only guy who ever did better than Ken in a tournament was that guy over there, Brad. Um, and he did it because he's just inhumanly fast. And it turns out one of the things that's really important in Jeopardy is how fast you can push a button, right? A, a light goes on, and then you push the button. And if you do it too early, you get locked out. And if you do it too late, the other guy wins. Brad was so fast that you often couldn't see the light go on. He literally was anticipating exactly when it was going to happen as the host was speaking. So these guys were both amazingly good Jeopardy players. And in a two-day tournament, IBM's Watson program beat them handily. Now, um, the final scores don't actually show that it got pretty exciting at the end. There was actually a moment where Ken Jennings could have won if, if some things had broken slightly differently. But, but the system was amazing. Now, a lot of people have looked at that game, and I'm not going to talk much. I have, a, again, another, whoops. Uh, I have another whole talk on how that stuff works. Uh, it's out on SlideShare if you go looking called Why Watson Works. Um, but one of the really interesting things about the Jeopardy game was it required a very broad kind of knowledge. Right? You had to answer questions about many different things. And also, the system was not connected to the internet. So it couldn't go out and look, which, by the way, was important because it couldn't have been fast enough if it actually had to go Google things. Like that. So a lot of stuff was brought in, pre-indexed, things like that. But it was very much a memory-based system. It had to answer the questions based on, and essentially, what it, quote, knew in some sense of new. And it had to handle language. Uh, the, these questions weren't designed for computers. They were actual Jeopardy game questions, things like that. So it was very exciting when the computer won. Um, about 15 years ago, some colleagues and I presented something called the Semantic Net Web. Most of you haven't heard about Some of you may have heard about it in that name. Some of you have heard about it with a bad reputation. Actually, it's used all the time. You see it every time you Google and, or use any other search engine, it comes up with something like this. So this is uh, how tall is Tom Cruise. You're not only getting the, what you got in the old days, which was a bunch of answers, but you actually now are getting something that says, this is what we think is the best answer. These are some other actors and how tall they are. Here's some other stuff about that person. And that's all using something called the knowledge graph. So the third technology is this associative knowledge. It, it harnesses information put in by all, in all sorts of ways. Facebook uses it for a lot of the stuff you're seeing that helps put ads on papers. Uh, so when you go to a page and it gives you a Facebook ad, how it chooses. Also, they power some other things. So this connectedness of the web with information, very simple information, has gone from a research idea to it's used by virtually every large company, uh, all the search engines. Amazon uses it very heavily, things like that. So it, it's the most successful failed success. So, so AI technologies tend to be seen as failing when they actually transition into the real world because people say, oh, that wasn't as hard as we thought, right? Uh, machines can do it. But this is a case where using huge amounts of information about what people are doing is feeding into what the systems can do and build and use. So those three technologies together have done, done a lot. But what's interesting is when you look at how this really works in practice, this is from a slide Peter Norvig, the research director at Google, presented at a conference last year. Um, he talked about what do we do between what we harness from what we find on the web and how we kind of line that up. So how do we get that information about how tall a particular actor is or things like that? And it's a combination of things that come in from the human fact base, things they pull from natural language, probabilistic inference algorithms, which is why quantum is so important to this group, uh, something called active learning about choice, and one in there called human judgments. 
right? And a lot of us sort of sat up when he, he, he talked about that. And he didn't give an example, but in another talk, somebody named Peter Mika, who had actually pioneered a lot of this stuff at Yahoo, gave the, uh, whoops, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, so Google has put all sorts of information in here, um, but this embedded information, so, so embedded metadata means people have put hints into their web pages, are showing up on literally billions and billions of pages, and that's what's being harnessed here by Google, by Facebook, by others. So we have a summary. Deep learning as a neural network has really gotten us um, ability to learn from data with high quality uh, imperfect results, but you're getting very close, very high quality. Lots of associative learning from data, uh, again, high quality but imperfect results. Semantic web, knowledge graph, graph links from extraction, clustering, and learning. So these, these set of what we might call associative technologies have all come together and have allowed some very important things to happen. But there are some problems, and this is where a lot of the recent thinking and where a lot of the research in the field is starting to go. Um, so this is the Peter Mika slide I was jumping at, which is association doesn't mean things are correct. So here from an early version of Yahoo's knowledge graph was the page for when you, you searched on Michelangelo, the artist, right? And it tells you Michelangelo, a little bit about him and when he was born and where and things like that. And there's the photo. Now, now most, some of you are laughing because you know that that's not a photo of the artist Mark Michelangelo, but the photo of a teenage ninja mutant turtle, a cartoon character named Michelangelo. Now, now, why is it making that mistake? It's actually making that mistake for a very obvious idea when you look at it, which is that on the web, right, if you look for a configuration of uh, a set of Renaissance artists who all show up together, you often find Michelangelo, Donatello, Leonardo, and Raphael. Those are the names of the four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And they show up together far more often and related to each other on, on all the information out there on the web than that. You as a human would know they're coming from a completely different context. The computer is associating the fact that this is the best picture it could find of Michelangelo based on all the associations it had about what someone named Michelangelo was. And that's why it picked that. So this gets us back to cats and ducks. I, I love telling this story because the first two words my daughter spoke were cat and duck. And actually for about, a, uh, about three, four months, they were the only two words she knew. So the whole world was divided between cats and ducks. My, my daughter is now finishing her doctoral thesis in linguistic anthropology. So she speaks a lot more words than cat and duck. But I called her up the other day. And I, I asked her some stuff about cats and ducks when I was writing the book, so it was about a year ago. Because here's the thing. If we think about these AI technologies I just showed you, so let's just look at, at sort of a deep learning technology, right? I, I'm sitting here, and this is the person, and this is the, uh, you know, some dog. And I, I train them both to tell the difference between cats and ducks. The dog will get significantly better than the human at being able to differentiate them. So if there's something behind that, Bush, and I asked you guys to tell, I would get probably a 50-50 response in the audience, uh, your dog would smell it perfectly and say, ah, that's a cat, or that's a duck, right? Even if I let you have the same sensory uh, stuff, it wouldn't help you much, okay? But when I asked my daughter, I called her up and I said, you know, can you tell me the difference between a duck and a cat? And the first thing she said is, oh, dad, you're not going to tell that story again. But, but after, I said, seriously, you know, supposing you were telling, she teaches kindergarten students during the summer, the difference between cats and ducks. And she said something like, if I was telling it to a kid, I'd probably say something like, the cat has fur and four legs and goes meow, and the duck is a bird and it swims and goes cat. And if you said to your dog, what's the difference between a cat and a duck? It would say, woof. I, I mean, we have an ability to reason and understand the symbols and put them together and come up with things like this that these learning mechanisms don't. And so that's where we were really talking about the human playing Go. We make a lot of assumptions about the other things they can do based on our knowledge that people are built this way. 
right? Not that we're just the best perceivers, but that we have ways of thinking. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip some of these things just in the interest of time, get to this one. So I mentioned, um, I mentioned this picture, right? So where we are today is we can answer questions like, which one would you sit on? Because you go out on the internet and you find things about cats and uh, about person, dogs, and chairs, and you see that chair associates most with sit, dog associates a little bit with kit, uh, with sit. If I ask which one is most likely to bite what, so if I asked you who could bite what, you'd probably say, okay, the dog could bite the kid, the dog could bite the chair, the kid could bite the chair, the kid could bite the dog, but I don't think the chair could bite the kid or the dog. Now, the way that our current AI systems would do that was essentially by saying, I've never seen a chair bite a kid or a dog, right? Not by saying there's something that the way you would do it, which is essentially by saying, I know that chairs are inanimate. I know that inanimate things don't bite things, right? Then you would also use some of that associative knowledge. Kids are more likely to bite dogs, or dogs are more likely to bite kids. You know, if I asked you which one is most likely to become a computer scientist someday, I hope most of you would say the dog. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I meant the kid, um, the, the person, right? And, and again, the system would get that right mostly because computer scientists are human, and, and so, so is the person. But if I said how, right? So you're the parent of this child and you'd like them to grow up to be a computer scientist, God forbid. Um, how would you do it, right? Well, you, would, you can think about long-term plans. You could think about some of the things you'd put into their early environment that eventually they'd need to go to high school and college and things like that, right? And the last question I'll ask you is, you know, which one would you save if the house was on fire, right? And most people will give the same answer, which is, uh, you know, I feel bad about the dog, I'm taking out the kid, and I don't really care about the chair, right? You can make these, these more and more complex ethical issues and their cultural differences and things like that, but we as humans are very good at this kind of question. My question is, would you hire a robot babysitter if you didn't know how it was going to answer that question? Right? So part of the question is not only do these things have to operate in our world, but we have to be able to know what they're going to do under very unlikely or different circumstances, and that's something that we're very bad at in AI today. So humans are very good at context. Right? We can look at a, a complicated situation and say, well, this would cause me to think this, but this would cause me to think that, and so sort of the gray area we, we navigate through. Computers want to get it to a zero or one. Sorry, guys. Uh, so maybe there is a quantum thing. So humans are very good at recognizing context and deciding when extraneous factors don't make sense. There's a story I, I don't have time to tell, but if you go read the story of a man named Stanislav Petrov, P-E-T-R-O-V, uh, he died recently, but we are all here because of this man, who uh, the world would likely have ended, at least for our developed civilizations, because this is a man who was sitting in a Russian nuclear um, launch bunker, saw what was happening. So the system said, I think, said the US is launching an attack. And he looked at it and said, you know, based on my human knowledge, I don't think that's what's happening. And so he decided not to launch the nuclear weapons from Russia, which turned out to be the right decision. If they had launched, we'd have launched, and you know, we'd have had nuclear war. And that's actually happened several times with different people realizing the importance. So we're sitting in a world today where a lot of hard problems are threatening us. Cancer genomics is being outpaced by the mutations as cancer spreads. If you look outside, you, you see wealth disparity growing around the world, but neighborhoods degrading. Climate warms while we argue about the causes, but we don't change our behaviors. So hard problems are out there right now that require a lot of complicated issues to be pulled together. They're interdisciplinary. They require huge amounts of data, which the computer is better at processing. They're full of this context and implication world, which we as humans are doing. So the argument I make is, essentially, the exist existential threat is not that AI systems are going to come and get so smart that they're going to wipe us out. The existential threat is we're not going to use them appropriately. 
And we're either going to build them to do things that would be better to not be using machines to do, or we're not going to use them in this kind of problem-solving situations where we must put together what humans are good at, that kind of um, judgment in context, and what computers are good at, that very fine knowledge and that very deep knowledge of very specific things. So I'll leave this up, but basically AI making huge stride. A lot of the need for some stuff that's traditional AI, and I had to cut out half an hour from my traditional talk, so that's the stuff that would have gone there. Um, and there are some things we need to do to put these together. And so what's interesting is the AI world is splitting into two different groups, one of which is primarily excited by this learning capability, and one of which is still saying we need to figure out how the humans are doing the stuff we do with context, things like that, planning, long-term reasoning, things which have traditionally been done by other parts of AI. And we need to come up with how to put them together, because if we don't do that, we really don't have the right technologies for taking on some of those big challenges I was just talking about. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, there's the book. <laughs>